Electric cars are becoming more common all over the world. In fact, a new survey from Kelly Blue Book shows that 36% of US buyers are seriously considering an EV as their next vehicle. One big hurdle is that the options aren't too expansive and they typically come at a premium, but this is changing. Today, we're going to check out the Hyundai Ioniq 5. It's the latest EV from Hyundai, starts around $40,000 MSRP, and packs a ton of great features. To many, this is one of the best new EV options out there, so we're going to break down everything this car has how it drives, how it stacks up against its competition, and get into the good and the bad. So let's get into it. The first thing to notice about the Ionic 5 is the exterior design. I almost wonder if they decided to repurpose the Ionic name because they want this car's design to be considered iconic. I think this just might be, at least on the outside. There is no other car on the road that looks quite like it, and every time I see one, I can't help but look. To some, it may be too boxy, but to others, it's the perfect balance of a futuristic box and a functional vehicle. It's a crossover SUV, and it's clearly set to compete with the EVs in this category. Mainly at the time of filming this video, that would be the Tesla Model Y, and then the Mustang Mach-E, but a few others in this category are starting to be delivered as well. All over, this car has design quirks. It's boxy, strange, and very distinctive. I like to think of it as a tame Cybertruck. It's like you took a Cybertruck, and they told you to rein it in, make it a Hyundai, and make it a small SUV. There's a particular design flow throughout the whole car as well that's worth pointing out. It's these pixels, or squares, and they're literally everywhere. The most obvious place is the rear light bar, which looks really great. It's made up of a ton of tiny squares. The headlights are similar, kind of these rectangular boxes made up of tons of small boxes that of course light up. And then there are pixels on the side mirrors that indicate your blinker as well. On the charge port door there are pixels, and when you open the charge port door that will show your charge status using pixels. The door panels have these on certain specs, along with the door sills where the Ionic 5 logo is, although this particular model does not have it there. The front doors have one pixel on them. On the gauge cluster when you shift into sport mode, the overall visualization turns into pixels. The center of the steering wheel doesn't say Hyundai or Ionic 5, but just features four of these. Then you can find these on the seats as well. I'm sure I missed some because you really can see them found throughout the whole car, and it's a very fun touch that's emphasizing this car's design. To finish out the general exterior, the wheels have a very distinct look to them. The wheel well has lines that match the wheels and extends that overall design. The lines on the body of this car are irregular and cool. The paint colors offered give it a distinct look, but after that you'll notice that it's a fairly normal and functional car. I'm reviewing the SE Standard Range Ionic 5, so this is actually the base model. Oftentimes it's actually great to review the base model because we see tons of reviews of the top spec version, and then we want to buy one that we can afford so we end up with way less features. In this case, the Ionic 5 only gets better than what I'm reviewing, and I'll note all of those differences throughout this video. The Ionic 5 seats 5, has a hatchback trunk, and even has a very small front trunk. This particular spec doesn't have an automatic trunk, but higher specs do. The trunk space is decent, but not amazing for a crossover SUV. The space in this car is mainly focused on occupants. It's not exceptionally large, but it does have a flat bed to load stuff into. That bed can also be lifted out for a bit more storage underneath, although this isn't really something like an additional under storage compartment. You'll also notice that the cargo space does get cut into quite a bit due to the sloped roof in the back. This is something that is common on vehicles this size. There's also a built-in cargo cover in the rear depending on your spec. The rear seats can fold flat as well for extra space, and this can definitely hold a lot when needed. I know that this would function incredibly well for me as a drummer. Up front is the front trunk, and the release for this is a very traditional latch. You even have to move the latch before lifting it like any gas vehicle. Some find this annoying, but I think they went this direction because this is not actually a front trunk. It's a tiny box underneath the hood that's really only large enough to fit something like a charging cable. If I owned this car, I would store something like that or even emergency supplies. I would never use this as a front trunk because it just isn't one. In any case, that's where all the storage is, but there's a great amount of space within the car as an occupant. To get in the car, you have a key fob as well as the app called Blue Link. The key fob works where the car automatically unlocks on approach, and it has buttons for opening the charge port and more. I didn't have app access during this review, but it should be fairly similar to many modern EV apps with various controls available. Then comes the interior. To get in, the door handles are similar to other EVs where they sit flush with 
with the door, but these pop out when unlocked. Inside, to get out, there are normal latches, but interestingly, to close the door, there is just this invisible gap. At first, for multiple people I showed this car to, we actually didn't know where to grab to close the door, but once you get it, it's pretty cool and works well. I will say that behind that handle is a pretty big gap and a place that will probably end up getting gross over time since you can't really get back there, and it's closed off on both ends. It just seems difficult to clean. The front seats are comfortable and have an impressive range of motion. You sit higher in this car than you may expect from videos, and it's a great view of the road. There are automatic controls on the side for seat adjustments, but since this is the base model, the passenger seat has 100% manual controls. In the back, there are three seats, two fairly standard seats and a center smaller one that can also fold down as an armrest and cup holder when needed. I was most impressed with the range of motion on these seats. There are various recline levels, and they recline much further than the Tesla Model Y, and further than many comparable vehicles. This could make it very comfortable for rear passengers on longer drives in the Ionic 5. Higher specs of this car also feature a glass roof, but here we don't have one. As you're starting to notice, there are a number of downgrades when you go for the base model, and it's part of what is making me lean towards recommending that those buying this car avoid the base model, but more on that in just a minute. The cabin view is simpler than many cars, but also far busier than something like a Tesla Model 3 or Y. It has dual screens lined up in a single line, and each screen is the same size. It's a good look, and the left screen is your gauge cluster, while the right one is for infotainment. To the left of these screens is this pad, and it's a little odd because it looks like a speaker, but apparently it's magnetic. But it's not strong enough to hold a phone or anything, so I don't really know what the purpose of it is. On the gauge cluster screen, you have all relevant info at all times. To me, it's nice to have a dedicated screen here, although this screen does feel a bit cluttered at times. It has visualizations showing you charge level, speed, regen braking, and more at all times, as well as gear selection, range, odometer, temperature, tire pressure, and other relevant info. It also has a visualization of your car, which won't show you cars around you or anything like that, but will light up red in a particular area if you're getting close to something else. The right screen is what you'll interact with for infotainment. It's the same size as the gauge cluster, and since it's positioned right with that screen, it can be a little bit of a reach, actually. To me, I noticed that reach most when I was trying to pause media or skip tracks, since there are no buttons to do these functions anywhere besides the screen. You can turn off media with the buttons off the wheel, or you can mute from the steering wheel, but you can't pause or skip tracks. This is something I'm used to always having on the wheel. Built into the software on screen is maps, navigation settings, certain climate settings, phone settings, and more. In this version, there's no surround view camera, but the highest spec does have that feature, which is really great to see. This is something I really wish Tesla would add to their cars. In this standard range, there's just a standard backup camera. Oddly, the default home screen doesn't really show you much. It's a nice clean design, but you have to swipe over to get to any functions on screen. And here's what that's like in practice. So this is the infotainment screen on the Ionic 5 and it is a pretty solid screen overall. First off, this is the home screen, and it doesn't really make that much sense as a home screen. It doesn't give you that much information. I wish maps were involved in some way, but I think this entire car is designed to use CarPlay because when you swipe over, you have your different options, and I noticed that all of this is its fairly quick. The refresh rate and everything is a pretty decent screen. You go to EV and you have different settings here, and then you go to Map, takes a second to load, and then this is like 15-year-old technology right here. I do not think that Hyundai expects you to use this at all, but it is built in here, and there's even a button down here to get to your maps whenever you need. So if I'm at the home screen, I can click map, which some people will like that, some people will think the buttons interfacing with the software isn't their favorite. You pick, of course, what you like the most. So if you're planning to use everything that's built into the car, like you might do in a Tesla or another electric vehicle that is trying to make their own system, you would be able to use media on here and you can use Bluetooth audio to your phone or you can listen to the radio and you have options right here to turn that off and on. And then if you wanna get back to maps, you press this button. There's also a nav button, which I think is a little odd because that brings you basically to navigation settings. And it's for places to go versus map. Would also take you there. You would just have to then press this search button. I find that a little redundant, but then you have a media button and that'll bring you to your media. However, as I was mentioning, the maps built into this is not good. Zooming around, you can just see how choppy this is. If this was the only thing you were going to use, I wouldn't even recommend this car. But there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and I think that's what they're expecting you to use. So I have connected my phone, and now I have Apple CarPlay, because I have an iPhone. If you had an Android, this would be an Android button right here. 
and Apple CarPlay has this home menu that really is much better than what Hyundai is providing you here. You have either Apple or Google Maps, depending on what you use. I believe Waze would work as well right there, and then you have Calendar, you have your media controls, and you have a few other options here. And then you can bring up various apps. So I personally use Tidal over Spotify or Apple Music, and it's right there. It has a great app and that's built in on screen. This is something that Tesla has started to implement because you can do Spotify and Tidal, but if you wanna do Apple Music on this, you have Apple Music right here, and that's something you can't do on a Tesla, but it's just built in because it's using CarPlay. As I mentioned, there are buttons there for certain functions, and to me, this feels like an in-between of a traditional system and a software-based one. Unfortunately, you really only want to use CarPlay or Android Auto Maps, so the Map and Nav buttons become useless. Next to those buttons are Media, which will bring you back to CarPlay, so that's nice to have, Tune for your radio, and the Parking Camera. Of course, on the left there is the Volume Knob for Media, which is also a Media Power button. Below that screen is buttons for climate control. You can control everything here and it can be nice to have this in a dedicated spot instead of on screen like many modern EVs. It does interface with the screen still though and you can see this when you click warmer. The options for heated seats pop up on the infotainment screen after clicking that and you dial it in on screen. Now, everyone has their opinions as to how many buttons should be in a car. Some absolutely hate Tesla's lack of buttons, and others think it's the epitome of fantastic design. I'm just sharing what buttons exist and what becomes useless so you can make your decision, but the one button in this car that I'll argue should not exist is the EV start-stop button. In a Tesla, you walk up, get in, the car turns on. You park, get out, the car turns off and locks. In the Ionic 5, you walk up, get in, and then you have to turn the car on. Sometimes you have to press it multiple times as well because you pressed it once, but you weren't pressing the brake so it won't let you go into drive yet and then you have to press it again while holding the brake to then go into drive. Also many functions of the car won't work until you turn it on. Here's an example. So we're reviewing the Ionic 5 right now and this is just one thing I need to point out. I don't know why EVs need a start stop button. I've seen people complain about this but I'm experiencing it very much in this because it'll beep at me if the car is on and the doors are open and I'm just kind of hanging around and right now I have it off because I wanna shoot and not get beeped at, but I can't even roll down the window until I go and actually go up front here and then press EV start and then this comes on and then I'll do this window. It says key not in vehicle. So here I'll put the key fob in the vehicle and then press my start stop button again Looks like I needed to press it twice because now we're actually on and this will hopefully roll down. Yes. When you park, you have to turn the car off with this button. If you forget, you will walk away and the car knows you're away from the car because of the key, but it will beep at you that you need to turn off the car since essentially the engine is still running. This is an adaptation of gasoline vehicles that does not need to exist in EVs. If it knows that I'm walking away from the car, it can turn it off eventually. It's just not necessary. I want to see this button removed in future versions of this car, but it's not a huge deal. In any case, the steering wheel, of course, has a number of buttons on and around it. There's a dedicated drive mode button attached to the wheel, buttons for driver assist features, phone call buttons, stocks for headlights and blinkers, a stock for the gear shifter that you twist to go into drive or reverse, and then panels for regen braking levels. In my experience, these panels just switch between full regen or no regen, driving more like a gas vehicle. The center console of this car is pretty nice because it feels spacious. There's a pass-through between the front seats, so there's plenty of room there. There's a front pocket area and the console with an armrest that can move up and down, a large opening for storage, cup holders, and USB ports. On the back of this as well, there are USB ports for rear passengers. I will say having USB-A ports in a 2022 car that's so futuristic looking is an odd choice. I think all of these should be USB-C, or at least some of them should be USB-C. There's also a wireless phone charger here, but as we found out, our base model didn't have this configured. Other versions of this car allow you to slide the whole console forward and backwards as well, but of course the base model doesn't have that either. Overall the interior is an interesting blend. The exterior is futuristic looking and inspired, but inside it's basically a normal Hyundai. The screens make it feel a little newer and nicer than other cars, but the interior feels a bit cheap at times. Of course I was in the base model, but even with all the upgrades brought in the better trims, the overall experience will feel the same. Many criticize Teslas for feeling cheap at this price, but this interior truly feels like a $20,000 car. So you're definitely aware that you're paying the extra money because it's electric. It functions well, but doesn't feel like a premium vehicle. It gets the job done. I also noticed one small rattle as well that popped up every once in a while. 
This isn't to say that it's bad and this car should be avoided though. I'm still very much a fan and the best part of it is driving it. That makes it worth the cost. Driving the Ionic 5 is fantastic. It's exactly what an electric car should be and Hyundai absolutely nailed it here. Regen braking feels great and the acceleration is much quicker than I expected on this base model. It's faster than most cars out there and works great in all situations. That instant torque is great and it's a big part of what many like in EVs. The car is quiet and it handles very well. The turn radius is also very good. It has what's great about smaller cars while packing a lot of space inside. I also noticed that the ride quality in the Ionic is far better better than the Model Y or 3 as well. It feels a lot lighter and going over bumps is just not a big deal. In the Model Y, you feel it much more and hear it much more when on a road that's rough. I actually asked my wife if she'd say it's better than the Model Y from a ride quality perspective and she said something like, oh, way better. It's very comfortable. You sit high in the car, higher than you may expect for its size, and it's a really great experience. Here I am driving it. There are two different driving modes for pedals specifically, and that is your regen braking options. So they call it eye pedal on here, and these paddle shifters can turn it on or off. I feel it's a little unnecessary as well, but right now it's off. This is driving more like a gas vehicle where it's kind of coasting for me, versus when I have eye pedal on, it's regen braking like I'm used to in most electric vehicles. So for driving modes, there's a button on the steering wheel, and there are three different ones. There's eco, normal, and sport and right now I'm in normal, and it's actually pretty zippy. This thing feels a lot faster than I expected after reading the specs online and just knowing that it was generally slower than other cars and it's a bigger SUV shape. As far as how this car drives and handles, I've actually really enjoyed it. My biggest complaints have been things with the interior and things with the software, but as an electric car and the way this drives, it's fantastic. There's not much left to be desired, especially at this price point and what this car is delivering. Now I'm in sport mode and I'm just gonna try out the acceleration. It's been pretty good from what I can tell. Here we go, yeah. That is very impressive, very zippy, much faster than you're gonna be used to in comparable vehicles. The one thing I have noticed with drive modes though is the button is right here and you can switch between them at any time. And it's actually kind of nice to have that button right there. You just click this twice and you're in sport. However, if you're cruising and you change modes, it changes instantly. It doesn't wait for you to let off the pedal and then change modes. And it doesn't seem to be calibrated very well. Here's an example. Right now I'm in sport and then I'm gonna not move my pedal at all. I have it down as far as I'm gonna go. My foot's not moving. Click the button and go into eco and immediately I am slowing down. I went from a little over 30 to the pedal is down the same amount and now I'm about 20. And the same thing happens the other way too. I'm cruising right now at 25. I press the button, it speeds me up and I'm going 30 with the same amount of force. Now, of course, it makes sense that it's different there and the pedal is calibrated differently, but it's weird to have it do it automatically for you in the middle of driving. It's just a button that will speed you up. So those are a couple small complaints, but overall driving this car, I'm very much enjoying it. It's a great driving experience from the pedal and the steering and the handling and the one pedal driving and the torque that you get because it's fully electric. It's a very well-made electric car. If this is the shape that you're looking for, I would probably recommend it as long as you're okay with some of the interior things that I mentioned. One other odd thing I noticed when driving this car is that I would have eye pedal on, which enables one pedal driving. However, when I went into reverse, it did not operate as one pedal driving. It suddenly was coasting backwards. And this is very jarring when you've been using one pedal driving for a while. Maybe this is a setting that can be dialed in, but either way, it should be always matched to the driving setting that I have enabled. Even with that though, it's a fantastic drive. Now, the big question with all EVs is, well, how do you charge it? Well, as always, for the majority of the time, you'll charge at home. If this will be your daily driver and you can charge at home, you are pretty much 100% set. You can plug in when you get home, set it to charge on your off-peak hours, which I was able to configure very quickly on screen, and when you wake up, your car is charged. I even was able to use my Tesla wall connector by just using a simple adapter. It worked like a charm, and this morning, the car charged up to 80%, just like I set it. It will save you time compared to filling up at a gas station all the time. For road trips though, that's where it's not as clear. Teslas have a vast supercharger network, and for some time, I think this will remain a huge advantage for them over other EVs like this. Other companies, including Hyundai here, are relying on third-party DC fast charging networks. These are pretty surprisingly expansive, especially if you haven't looked into it. Go look at companies like Electrify America. They have chargers everywhere, but they're just not as sure as a dedicated network. The main one I hear about is what I just mentioned, Electrify America, so we went to charge at Electrify America. I was hoping to find a 
350 kilowatt hour charger, because Hyundai says that you can charge from 10 to 80% at these stations in 18 minutes. That's actually faster than you can do in a Tesla. This is in ideal conditions though, and assuming that you can find a charger at that speed, but our station only went up to 150 kilowatt hours. Still, that's very fast, and we did a small test, gaining about 26 kilowatt hours of energy in 16 minutes, from about 43% up to 74% in that amount of time. We did have issues at this charger though, and unfortunately, this is something that can happen at these stations. We're at Electrify America charging this. I was hoping there was a 350 kilowatt hour charger. There's not at this particular station. So we're limited to 150, but we plugged into this one because it says plug in first and then the card reader didn't work. That means I can't use this station just because it couldn't read my card. And so then I had to move to another one, which is something we see happening a lot, unfortunately, with Electrify America. So I moved to this one, I plugged in, and then the screen is basically dead on this one. If you look here, like there's just a dark spot over the whole thing. But I was able to plug in, the card reader worked, and then it said initializing up here at the very top part of the charger that actually works. So at least that part of the screen worked to show me that it was charging, but that one wouldn't read my card and this one has a broken screen. Definitely not a great first experience with the Ionic 5 charging out on public chargers. This isn't to say that this will happen to you, but it is something to be aware of, and it does happen more often than I wish was the case. I really hope this improves significantly in the future, as we will need reliable third-party charging for tons of great EVs like this. Again, though, it's not a guaranteed issue or anything that you'll have, but something to be aware of. As I mentioned throughout, we reviewed the base model. It drove incredible, but we noted a lot of downgrades that the SE trim comes with. It doesn't have an automatic trunk, there are no window shades, there's no glass roof or sunroof, there are no air vents for rear passengers, there are less seat options, there's no heated steering wheel, no garage door opener, and the passenger seat is entirely manual. The center console doesn't slide and there's no wireless charger. There's a great comparison from out of spec reviews that breaks down each trim in detail if you're interested and I'll link that in the description below. To me, the lack of features on the SE trim is a really unfortunate thing on this car. It's a $40,000 car and you really don't feel that until you drive it. It drives like something in that price, but then you are missing a lot of things that should be there for the price. To me, that leads me to recommend that if you're buying this car, you should upgrade to the SEL or limited trim. If you're already paying $40,000, the extra $6,250 will bring you a ton of interior features that level up your experience and it will get you a larger battery for more range and more peace of mind on road trips. It will make this car just that much better and the interior will be much more up to what you see on the exterior and feel when you're driving it. This is how many companies make and price their cars, but reviewing the SE standard range model really showed me how they get you to upgrade. Now at the same time, even if you go with the limited spec, which is the premium trim that treats you with high-end features, MSRP is about $15,000 less than the Model Y starts at in the United States, and it includes a fairly comparable range. So this car is a great option, even if you have to upgrade that trim. Throughout this car, there is a lot of good. I highly recommend it to those looking for a great EV and hoping to save a little bit of money compared to a Tesla. If you want solid range, comfortable ride quality, a zippy EV, CarPlay, Android Auto, a comfortable cabin for five, fast charging, more familiarity when coming from a gas vehicle, and a standout modern exterior design, this car may be perfect for you. On the other side of things, if third-party charging is a huge concern for you, you want a completely different modern style vehicle, or you want incredible built-in software instead of relying on CarPlay or Android Auto, it may not be for you. I'm really excited about the Ionic 5 and hope this review was helpful for you. In the meantime, if you want to compare and see my full review of the Tesla Model Y after two years of ownership, you can check out that video linked up here or in the description below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.